Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Parkinson's disease and anti-Parkinson drugs. Okay, right, so we've now discussed the anatomy of the basal ganglia. What I now want to move on to is discussing the model of what the basal ganglia are actually involved in doing. What is their function within the motor system? Okay, and we're going to look at the model uh, which says that the function of the basal ganglia is in action selection. It basically is the model that says that the basal ganglia function in giving the permissive signal that says, okay, you can actually initiate this movement. Okay, now develop this idea more now. Okay, right. Now, I should just say something about the nature of science at this point. What we're about to look at is a model, okay? A model that helps us understand reality. And it is the best model that we have that helps us understand why loss of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra pars compactor produces the hypokinesia, which is the cardinal feature of Parkinson's disease, okay? Uh, however, it is just a model, okay? It's just something that humans have constructed to help us understand reality, okay? And there are, the, well, there is growing evidence that um, this model is flawed, basically. There is growing evidence against this model. However, it is still the best model we have, uh, so I'm going to present this model then. Right, so, uh, before we can uh, talk about the basal ganglia, we need to know something uh, about the way the motor system works, okay? So I'm going to talk about uh, the motor system and how you uh, produce movements, okay? How you produce voluntary movements, and then we'll see how the basal ganglia is going to play a role here. Okay, so this is going to involve quite a few pieces of cerebral cortex. So we'll go back to this picture where we see the um, cerebral hemisphere, the left cerebral hemisphere here from the side. Okay, now, firstly, we need a, a landmark structure of the cortex, which is the central sulcus here. So uh, the cortex is the outer layer of the cerebral hemispheres. It's where a lot of the neuron cell bodies are located. Okay, now there's an invagination in the, of the cortex that is very distinguishable that lies uh, in this sort of position here. And this is known as the central sulcus. Okay, now this is a landmark that is used to identify certain portions of the cerebral cortex. Okay, now one of the pieces of cerebral cortex that this allows you to identify is um, the primary motor cortex, which is the portion of cortex sitting just in front of the central sulcus here. Okay, so in red here, this is the primary motor cortex, okay, also known as M1 for short, okay? M for motor, and then 1 for primary. Okay, now this is the area that sends neurons down all the way into the spinal cord, and these neurons uh, will then tell the motor neurons, which have their cell bodies in the spinal cord, what to do, basically. They'll tell them to fire action potentials, and those motor neurons will then synapse onto skeletal muscle fibers. Okay, so... Basically, uh, this is a relay station which can send information down into the spinal cord, and we'll put this all together once we've seen the next portions that lie in front of the primary motor cortex. Okay, right. So in front of the primary motor cortex, there are the areas that are collectively known as secondary motor cortex. Okay, so up here in green, okay, there is an area known as the supplementary motor area or the SMA for short. Okay, so this portion of cortex is known as the supplementary, that's the S, okay? The M is for motor, okay, and then the A is for area, so the supplementary motor area, and it is part of the secondary motor cortex, okay? Then another portion of secondary motor cortex lies down here in blue, and this is known as the premotor cortex, okay? So this is the premotor cortex, or sometimes people will call it the premotor area. So premotor cortex here. And together, these two areas, the supplementary motor area and the premotor area, they are collectively known as the secondary 
motor cortex, or more rarely you can hear them actually called M2. Okay, right. So, what then is the model for how the motor system works? Well, the model is that the secondary motor areas, okay, the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex, these produce what is known as a motor plan. Okay, now what is meant by a motor plan? Okay, well let me try and give you the motivation for what a motor plan is. So basically, if you want to carry out some movement, let's say you want to pick up uh, this pen here, so I want to pick up this pen. If I want to actually carry out that movement, I need a huge number of different muscles to contract. Okay, and they all need to contract by the exact right amount, and they all need to contract at the right time. So, you know, at different portions of the movement, I need different muscles contracting. So, it's a hugely synchronized effort on the uh, parts of a huge number of muscles. Okay. In order to get these muscles to contract in the exact way that I want, okay, at the exact right time, you need to be sending a very elaborate uh, sequence or collection of action potentials, okay, in both space and time, okay, so you need to be activating a huge number of different neurons which are going to send their axons to a huge number of different muscles, and they also need to be activated at exactly the right time to the exact right degree, okay, so they need to be sending action potentials at the correct frequency, okay, so this incredible collection of action potentials, this arrangement of action potentials that you need to be sending down neurons uh, in order to uh, get the muscle to actually, uh, well, the muscles, not just the muscle, the muscles, all the muscles that are going to be involved in the movement, to contract in this incredible um, synchronized way to actually produce the movement. Okay, that collection of action potentials is known as the motor plan. Okay, right. So it's believed that the secondary motor cortex is what generates this incredible sequence of action potentials, basically, that is then going to be uh, sent down to the motor neurons and is then going to initiate this incredible movement. Okay, right. So the secondary motor cortex then comes up with this incredible arrangement of action potentials that is needed to actually make the movement. And then the idea is that it just passes the motor plan onto the primary motor area, and then the primary motor cortex or the primary motor area uh, then relays it down to the spinal cord, and then uh, you'll actually make that movement. Okay, right. There's one more area that I want to add on here, and we're going further forwards all the time. Okay, so an area now in front of um, the secondary motor cortex here in pink. Okay, this is what's known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, so this is called the dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex. Now, I'll just explain to you in a moment um, what is actually meant by dorsal uh, in terms of the brain, so prefrontal cortex. Okay, now for short, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is often abbreviated to DL for dorsal lateral, and then uh, PFC for prefrontal cortex. Okay, right, so you might be wondering, dorsolateral, why on earth is it called that? It's right at the front of the brain, surely it should be ventrolateral, okay? But, in the case of the brain, dorsal does not mean what it means uh, in the case of peripheral anatomy, okay? So in the case of peripheral anatomy, dorsal means towards your back, okay? And ventral means towards your front. Effectively, dorsal means the same as posterior, and ventral means the same as anterior. Okay, in the case of the brain, it's different. Dorsal means towards the top of the brain, okay, and ventral means towards the base of the brain. Okay, now you might wonder why is that? Well, basically, you view the brain as though it's flopped over, basically. You view the brain as though it was rotated 90 degrees, so you kind of view it like it was this instead of how it actually is. Okay, so you view it like it's that instead, as though it's just flopped over. I think the reason for this is that in embryology the brain does kind of start like that, and then when the embryo folds over, the brain then sort of folds forward like that. I don't know whether that is actually the reason, but that's why uh, 
dorsal means the top of the brain rather than uh, the back of the brain down here. Okay, and ventral means the base of the brain. Okay, so that's the origin then of this being called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex because it's near the top of the brain and also it's on the lateral aspect. Okay, now, how am I going to then insert the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex into the motor system? Well, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is often uh, viewed as the executive controller. Okay, so the function of it is often described as executive control. Now, what do I mean by executive control? Well, I mean deciding what you are going to do, basically. Okay, so when you wake up and decide what you're going to do today, okay, when you make a plan about what you're going to do today, it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that is doing that. When you decide to pick up a pen, it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that decides to pick up the pen. Okay, that's what the dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex is incredibly involved in doing executive control. Okay, so to add this into our model then, when you decide to pick up a pen, what will happen is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex will decide to pick up the pen. It will then send the secondary motor cortex, the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex, the instruction which says, we're going to pick up a pen, create me the motor plan that will make us pick up the pen, okay? The secondary motor cortex comes up with that motor plan, it relays it to the primary motor cortex, which then sends it down uh, to the uh, spinal cord, and then it's actually initiated and you make that movement. Okay, right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to insert the basal ganglia in to this picture here. Okay, so I want to now give you the motivation for why we need the basal ganglia at all. Okay, so basically the secondary motor cortex comes up with a huge number of motor plans all the time. Okay, even when you don't want to actually make movements, it's not, you know, it's not going to be completely off. It's still making motor plans, basically. Okay, and you don't want these motor plans to actually be initiated. You do not want them to go to the primary motor cortex and be sent down uh, to the um, motor neurons and actually uh, form a movement. Okay, so there is effectively a checkpoint a checkpoint that allows motor plans from the secondary motor cortex to be then relayed to the primary motor cortex. Okay, a gatekeeper if you like. This is a word that's often used with regards to the basal ganglia, that they are a gatekeeper. They give the permission for the uh, motor plan that the secondary motor cortex has come up with um, to be in it relayed to the primary motor cortex and actually be initiated. They are what gives the permission for the motor plan to be relayed from the secondary motor cortex to the primary motor cortex and actually be initiated. Okay, And they stop all the other motor plans that you don't want to actually initiate from being initiated. Okay, so to put this then in um, into this model in a very basic way, what then happens is if the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex decides that it wants to actually make a movement, such as picking up the pen, it will tell the secondary motor cortex, okay, uh, to make a motor plan for picking up the pen. Okay, the secondary motor cortex will then make that motor plan. In addition, it will send signals down to the basal ganglia, okay, I'll put them in sort of here, so we know the basal ganglia are down here, okay, and it will say to the basal ganglia, look, we have permission for this motor plan that we've just created to actually go forward to the uh, primary motor cortex. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex told us to make this motor plan, okay? Uh, so you need to give us permission, and then the basal ganglia will send back its permission to the secondary motor cortex, and then what will happen is the secondary motor cortex will then relay this motor plan to the primary motor cortex, and it will be initiated, basically. That's a very, very basic model of how um, the basal ganglia fits into the motor system. 
transfer, okay, it gives permission for motor plans that the uh, secondary motor cortex has created uh, to actually be transferred onto the primary motor cortex and then be relayed down to uh, the motor neurons and therefore actually be initiated. And that's how it's so important in uh, the initiation of voluntary movement, okay, because without it giving this permission to the secondary motor cortex, the secondary motor cortex is going to really struggle to send the motor plan to the primary motor cortex, okay? And this is why if you get problems with the basal ganglia, such as in Parkinson's disease, you struggle to make voluntary movements because even though your secondary motor cortex will create the motor plans, it's not going to get this permission to actually send them to the primary motor cortex, okay? And therefore, you're going to have real Problem, uh, problems in actually initiating movement. Okay, now of course we're going to study this in more detail. We would not have gone into all the anatomical detail of the basal ganglia if this was all we were going to talk about with regards to what the basal ganglia are actually doing. We are going to look at how they give permission in this way to the secondary motor cortex in much more detail. Okay, right. So we're going to work backwards. We're not going to start here and go forwards, okay? I think it's best to work backwards. I think it's best to start with how do the basal ganglia give permission to the secondary motor cortex to uh, send this motor plan to the primary motor cortex. Okay, well, basically, there are thalamic nuclei, okay? It's not actually the basal ganglia that's give the permission, okay, they have a relay boot, if you like, the basal ganglia will give the permission to the thalamus, and the thalamus will then give uh, the permission to the secondary motor cortex, and it's for this reason that this pathway that we're going to talk about, this pathway here, okay, this loop, is known as the cortico, okay, so because it's coming from the cortex, then it's basal ganglia, okay, because it's going to the basal ganglia, and then it's thalamocortical pathway because then it goes to the thalamus and then finally from the thalamus it's going to go back to the cortex. Okay, right, so we are now going to discuss this thalamocortical projection firstly. Okay, and I've missed out the final word, it's the corticobasal ganglia thalamocortical pathway. And if you like, you could put the motor pathway there. Okay, right. Um, so, we want to discuss the thalamocortical projections because those are what are actually going to give permission to the secondary motor cortex to send the motor plan from the secondary motor cortex to the primary motor cortex. Okay, so this is going to involve um, a little bit of study of the thalamus. Okay, we need to now study the thalamus in more detail than we've studied it previously. Okay, specifically we need to have a look at the separate nuclei of the thalamus. Okay, so going back to this picture here then. Okay, we have shown the thalami previously. What I'm now going to do is pull out one of these thalami. Let's say we'll take the right thalamus, because we're, all, we're always working with the left one here. In fact, actually, no, we'll stick with the left one. We'll work with the left one. Let's take the left thalamus here and have a look at the different nuclei uh, within the left thalamus, okay? And then we'll see the specific nuclei of the left thalamus, and, but it's also the same on the right side as well, okay? Which are going to send permission to the left uh, secondary motor cortex to send the motor plan to the primary motor cortex. Okay, right. So, I'm now drawing the left thalamus here, which remember will be sitting on top of the left midbrain, or the left side of the midbrain, I should say. Okay, right. Now, the thalamus is conveniently divided up anatomically for us, okay, because there is this structure which separates the thalamus up into different portions, okay, and this is known as the internal medullary lamina, okay, and this separates the thalamus up, okay, so this is called the internal medullary lamina, and it actually contains some nuclei uh, itself, known as the intralaminar nuclei, which we're not going to really talk about. Okay, so we'll colour in the internal medullary lamina, which is going to split up the thalamus into these three separate regions, here in blue. Okay, now remember we are drawing the left 
thalamus here. So this side where it projects in like this, where the internal medullary lamina is asymmetric, it's this is the medial side and this is the lateral side. Okay, and if we were drawing the right thalamus, it would be symmetric to this, so the internal medullary lamina always curves round towards the medial side, basically. Okay, so if I briefly just draw a little picture of the right thalamus here, drawn much smaller than the left thalamus, its internal medullary lamina would look like this, okay, so it would be symmetric to the internal medullary lamina of the left thalamus here. Okay, right. Now let's have a look at some of the nuclei of the uh, thalamus then. Okay, so firstly this anterior portion of the thalamus here, okay, which is um, separated from the rest of the portions of the, thalami, uh, of the thalamus by uh, the internal medullary lamina here. Okay, this is the portion that contains the anterior nuclei of the thalamus. Now there is not just one anterior nucleus um, of the left thalamus. Instead, there are many nuclei in the this section of the left thalamus alone. Okay, so this contains the anterior nuclei. Okay, right. Now, uh, another section that we'll colour in easily is uh, this section that is on the medial face of the thalamus here. Okay, and again has its own special section that is um, separated out by the internal medullary lamina. Okay, so this portion that I've now highlighted in red here, this is what's known as the mediodorsal thalamic nucleus. So this is the mediodorsal uh, nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, right. And of course this is the mediodorsal nucleus of the uh, left thalamus. Right, okay, so uh, let's put on some more nuclei then. So now we'll take on this bigger space here. Okay, so right at the back, over here, this portion of the thalamus is known as the pulvinar. Okay, so I'll colour this in in purple here. Now this portion uh, is incredibly involved in intention. Um, okay, so this is called the pulvinar. Okay, right, and so far we have not seen the thalamic nuclei which we are interested in, but we're about to see the thalamic nuclei which are going to be involved in this cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical motor pathway. Okay, right, so let's see the first one of the nuclei uh, that we're actually going to be interested in, okay, and this is going to be the ventro-anterior thalamic nucleus. Okay, so this is right at the front of this uh, third portion of the thalamus then here. Okay, this is called the ventro, and then it's ventro-anterior thalamic nucleus. And for short, the ventro-anterior thalamic nucleus is often abbreviated as the VA uh, nucleus. I should just put nucleus there. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll colour in the ventro-anterior thalamic nucleus in green here. Okay, now working backwards, uh, the first nucleus that I'm going to show is going to be the dorsolateral thalamic nucleus. So this one here is going to be the dorsolateral thalamic nucleus, and I think I'll put the label here. So all of this is the dorsolateral thalamic nucleus. Now this isn't going to be involved in our cortico-basal ganglia uh, thalamocortical motor pathway. Okay, so this is the dorsolateral thalamic nucleus, so I'll colour this one in in yellow here. Oops. Okay, so there's our dorsolateral thalamic nucleus. Now, the next one that's actually going to be important to us, and this is the final one that's actually going to be important, but I will continue on just so that we have a complete picture of the thalamic nuclei. Okay, this here, this is the ventrolateral thalamic nucleus. Okay, so this is ventro lateral nucleus, and for short, the ventrolateral thalamic nucleus is often abbreviated as the VL nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, right, so let's colour in the ventrolateral thalamic nucleus in red here. Okay, so all of that is this ventrolateral thalamic nucleus, and that, again, is going to be incredibly involved in this pathway, so these are the two thalamic nuclei that are going to be important in this cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical motor pathway. Okay, on both sides, so we're looking at this entire machinery on the left-hand side, but the same thing will be happening on the right-hand side, so it's completely symmetric. Okay, right. Um, now, uh, just a few final thalamic nuclei. There are only three more left, okay, so we might as well complete it up. 
So, running parallel to the dorsolateral thalamic nucleus, shown here in yellow, we also have uh, what's known as the lateral posterior thalamic nucleus. Okay, so I'll put that here in orange. Okay, so this one that, run, that runs nice and parallel to the dorsolateral nucleus is known as the lateral posterior nucleus. And for short, the lateral posterior nucleus uh, is usually abbreviated to the LP nucleus. So this is the LP nucleus in orange there. Okay, now the final two nuclei of the thalamus that we have to show are the ventroposterolateral nucleus and also the ventroposteromedial nucleus. Now, we can't actually show the ventroposteromedial nucleus on the picture that we've shown here. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to chop through the thalamus like so, and we're going to... Uh, look at the inside of the thalamus. So imagine I've chopped down with a carving knife, chopped it into two, and we're now going to have a look at the internal aspect of the thalamus. And by looking at this different angle, uh, what we're going to be able to do is see where the ventroposteromedial thalamic nucleus is, and then we'll have a complete picture of the thalamic nuclei. Okay, so this firstly, this is the uh, internal medullary lamina here in blue, splitting the thalamus down the middle. Okay, then on the medial aspect, we of course have the mediodorsal thalamic nucleus in red here. Okay, we then also have a bit of the dorsolateral nucleus of the thalamus in yellow here, and we also have the lateral posterior nucleus here in orange. Now, that's why looking at the thalamus from this different section is actually really helpful for our understanding, because if we had not looked at it from this other angle, we might have thought that these two nuclei went all the way down, like the mediodorsal nucleus, when in fact they just um, form like a little slice of the pie, effectively, and much more of this is taken up by this final bit of space that we haven't yet coloured in. Okay, now most of this is going to be the ventroposterolateral thalamic nucleus, but a little portion hidden right at the middle here is going to be the ventroposteromedial thalamic nucleus. So this portion in turquoise here, this is the ventroposteromedial thalamic nucleus. Okay, or, or for short, the ventroposteromedial thalamic nucleus is often abbreviated as the VPM nucleus. Okay, now we can't see the ventroposteromedial nucleus from this top picture that we've got here. Okay, however, we can see the nucleus that surrounds uh, the ventroposteromedial nucleus and takes up the rest of this space, and that nucleus is the ventroposterolateral nucleus shown in here in pink. So all of this space here, that's the ventroposterolateral thalamic nucleus. Okay, and for short, the ventroposterolateral thalamic nucleus is often abbreviated as the VPL nucleus. V for ventro, L for lateral, oh whoops, no, not like that, uh, P for postro, ventro, uh, and then P for postro, and then L for lateral. So VPL nucleus, the ventroposterolateral nucleus. Okay, right, so those are the different nuclei of the thalamus then. Okay, now the only two that we're actually going to need for the discussion of this cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical motor pathway are the ventroanterior nucleus shown here in green and the ventrolateral nucleus shown here in red. Okay, because these are the nuclei which send projections up to the cortex uh, to give permission to the secondary motor cortex to send this motor plan to uh, the primary motor cortex. Okay, so let's have a look at these pathways. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over onto the next page, and now I'm going to draw all of this out. So uh, let's firstly put the cortex here, and we're going to start putting things together um, to make this pathway up. Okay, so here is our picture of the left cerebral hemisphere from the side. Now I should stress that everything we're going to discuss is going to be on the left hand side. Okay, however, it will be symmetrical on the right hand side. So you have all of these equivalent bits occurring on the right hand side as well. Okay, right. So here is your um, left primary motor cortex, here in red. Okay. Uh, here is the premotor cortex, here in blue, 
okay, which is a key portion of the um, secondary motor air cortex. Okay, then in um, green here we have our supplementary motor area. Okay, right, now let's draw on the left thalamus here. Okay, like so. Here is our thalamus. Now, of course, it's not actually shown where it would be, but I'm uh, taking bits out so that we can uh, see the pathway more clearly. Okay, here we have um, the internal medullary lamina, and don't worry, I won't draw out all the nuclei again. Okay, we'll draw out the two that are important to us, the ventroposterior, uh, sorry, the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral thalamic nucleus. So here is the ventroanterior, and here is the ventrolateral thalamic nucleus. So we'll colour those ones in. So here is the ventrolateral in red, okay, and in green, this is the ventroanterior. Okay, right. So what happens is the, there are a huge number of neurons in these two nuclei, and they're projecting up, and I'm only going to show this for one of them, okay, but of course there's a huge number of neurons in here, projecting up to the secondary motor cortex, okay, and they release the activatory neurotransmitter glutamate, okay, so they are excitatory neurons, okay, so I'll colour them in in vivid purple here. So we will denote excitatory um, neurons which release glutamate in vivid purple. Okay, so these have the capacity to give permission. Okay, so when these fire, uh, they can give permission to the secondary motor cortex that that motor plan needs to go forward to the primary motor uh, cortex. Now, of course, the secondary motor cortex is a big place, okay? There are loads of different areas of this, and all of the different areas might be coming up with different motor plans that relate to different portions of the body, okay? So, you don't want to give permission necessarily to all of the different places of the secondary motor cortex to send their motor plans on to the primary motor cortex. So instead, when you actually are going to activate this to give permission, okay, you're only going to activate little bits of the ventroanterior and ventrolateral thalamic nucleus, uh, thalamic nuclei rather, which will then send permission to a certain bit of the secondary motor cortex to uh, give permission for its motor plan to be moved on to the primary motor cortex, and then you're not going to send permission to everywhere, basically. So, what I'm trying to say here is that the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral nuclei are big, big structures, okay? They have a lot of neurons in, and they're going to send axons all over the secondary motor cortex. When you give permission, you're not going to activate the entire ventroanterior and the entire ventrolateral nucleus, because then you would give permission for absolutely every movement, basically, and you don't want that. Okay, you're only going to activate little bits of these nuclei, and therefore you're going to give permission for certain motor plans to be moved forward from the secondary motor cortex to the primary motor cortex. Okay, right, so that's these nuclei which can give permission to the secondary motor cortex for um, the um, motor plan to be moved forward. So what we now need to discuss is, well, why are these not all the time active, okay? Uh, what is stopping these uh, nuclei from actually activating uh, the secondary motor cortex all the time and allowing every single motor plan to be developed and go on to uh, the primary motor cortex? Well, basically, you have certain nuclei of the basal ganglia which are responsible for stopping these neurons in these two nuclei from firing, usually. Okay, and these two nuclei that are important in doing this are the internal globus pallidus and also the substantia nigra pars reticulata. Okay, so let's draw these structures out and add them on to our picture. So here is the lenticular nucleus shown here. Here is the internal globus pallidus here, and I wish I'd drawn it bigger now. Okay, I'm also going to put on the substantia nigra. Uh, where should I try and put this? I'll put the midbrain. Now, obviously, the midbrain should really be underneath the thalamus, but I'm going to draw it slightly to the side of the thalamus so that we can see things more clearly. Okay, because this picture is going to be complicated enough already. Okay, now I'll only draw the left half of the midbrain. Well, actually, since I've started it now, I'll put the right half on as well. Okay, but I'll only put the left substantia nigra on, because that 
is going to be involved in the left system here, and the right one will be involved in the right system. Okay, so remember the substantia nigra is going to be divided into these two pieces. The substantia nigra pars reticulata is the lateral piece, and the substantia nigra pars compacta is the medial piece here. Okay, so at the moment we're not actually interested in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is the place with the dopaminergic neurons. We're interested in the substantia nigra pars reticulata here, and we're also interested in the internal globus pallidus here, okay, which we'll colour in in orange. Okay, so both of these areas, both the internal globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, you can effectively think of them as the same thing, just separated anatomically. They are effectively the same thing that has somehow managed to get separated uh, over evolution. Okay, so both of them contain GABAergic neurons, which mean that they are inhibitory neurons. They're going to stop other neurons from firing action potentials. And they're going to have these neurons projecting onto these two nuclei, the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral thalamic nuclei. Okay, so here are inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And I will denote inhibitory neurons in blue from now on. Okay, so these are inhibitory neurons of both the substantia nigra pars reticulata and also the internal globus pallidus. And they are releasing the neurotransmitter GABA, which uh, acts on the postsynaptic neuron and makes it less likely that the postsynaptic neuron is going to fire an action potential. Okay, right. So, this is what stops the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral thalamic nuclei from giving permission to the secondary motor cortex all the time. Okay, basically you've got these two nuclei, the internal globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, which are both inhibiting the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral thalamic nuclei all the time, and therefore the neurons in these two thalamic nuclei are not going to be firing action potentials, and therefore they're not going to be giving permission to the secondary motor cortex, and therefore the motor plans that the secondary motor cortex is drawing up all the time are not actually going to be turned into movements, which is exactly what we want. We only want motor plans which were uh, actually um, formed because the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which I haven't shown here, but I'll put it in now. Okay. Uh, we only want the motor plans which were formed because the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex told the secondary motor cortex to form this motor plan to actually go forth and be initiated and sent to the primary motor cortex. Okay, right. So that's what usually is stopping um, motor plans from going on to the primary motor cortex. Okay, uh, so what we now want to see is how, um, when the secondary motor cortex knows that the motor plan that it's actually building needs to actually be initiated because it received the instruction from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex here, we want to see how the secondary motor cortex is going to change this apparatus here so that um, you actually allow the motor plan to be developed and to be sent to the primary motor cortex. So we want to see how is the secondary motor cortex going to change this basically? What signals is it going to send? Okay, right. Now I think what we will do is we will draw a separate picture now to show the next step in this, rather than trying to put it all into one picture. Okay, I think it will make more sense to, I think it will make more sense and be clearer if we draw separate pictures. Okay, so, we will start by drawing out the left cerebral hemisphere again. Okay, so here it comes. Here is the temporal lobe here. Okay, we've then got our central sulcus here. Okay. We've got our primary motor cortex here in red, okay, our supplementary motor area here in green, okay, and here in blue, this is our uh, premotor cortex here. Okay, now, let's say that our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which I'll put here in turquoise then, has given the instruction to the secondary motor cortex to uh, 
produce some sort of motor plan. Okay, so the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has taken the executive decision that we are now going to actually perform a movement. Okay, it sends that signal to the secondary motor cortex, and the secondary motor cortex now starts developing the motor plan. And let's say it's this little portion of the secondary motor cortex that is actually developing the motor plan. Okay, all the other portions are developing nonsense motor plans that you have no intention of actually performing. Okay, so you don't want to perform those. Okay, right. Now what's going to happen is the secondary motor cortex is going to send signals to the dorsal striatum. Okay, so remember the dorsal striatum is both the putamen and the chordate. Okay, however the main portion that's actually involved in this motor pathway is the putamen. Okay, so I'll put this here. So here is the ventricular nucleus once again. Okay, consisting of the putamen, the external globus pallidus, and the internal globus pallidus. So this is the putamen here. Okay, now, I'm just deciding, do I want to put on the chordate nucleus? I've decided I'm not going to put on the chordate nucleus. The first reason is because it will make the picture look more complicated than we need the picture to look. Okay, and the second reason is that truly this motor pathway is more, uh, well, m more of the motor pathway is in the putamen than it is in the chordate. Uh, so a lot of this is happening in the putamen rather than the chordate, so it's kind of true just to put the putamen here. Okay, right. So, what's going to happen then is the cortex is going to send excitatory um, axons down into the putamen. And of course, I've shown one again here, but in reality, you're going to be getting a huge number of these fibers coming down from the cortex into the putamen here. Okay, and now what's going to happen is this is these fibers are going to be activating two separate pathways. Okay, now the first pathway we are going to discuss is what's known as the direct pathway. And this is the pathway by which you actually activate um, the uh, permissive signal to go to the portion of cerebral cortex where the motor plan is being drawn up that you actually want to initiate. Okay, so for that reason, the direct pathway is also sometimes known as the permissive pathway. Okay, so direct or permissive pathway. Okay, so these excitatory fibers are coming down from the secondary motor cortex, okay, which knows that this motor plan needs to actually be initiated because it got the signal, it got the instruction from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, and what's going to happen is this is going to activate neurons in the putamen. Okay, now these neurons in the putamen, they are not going to be excitatory neurons. They are going to be inhibitory neurons, okay? Um, and uh, they are therefore going to be releasing the neurotransmitter GABA, okay? And they are going to be sent to two places. Firstly, the internal globus pallidus here, which I'll highlight in orange, and also the substantia nigra pars reticulata. So I think before we go any further, I need to catch up with the drawing, okay? So we need to put more structures on here. So I'll put my thalamus here, okay? And once again, it's my left thalamus here. Here's the internal medullary lamina here, okay? And here are those two nuclei that we need, the ventral anterior nucleus, here VA, and also the ventrolateral nucleus here, VL. Okay, let's colour those in. So ventral anterior there in green, and ventrolateral here in red. Okay, then we'll also put on the midbrain here so that we've got our substantia nigra pars reticulata. Okay, and if you're wondering where the substantia nigra pars compactor is going to play a part, we're not going to see the role of the substantia nigra pars compactor until right at the end. Okay, so we'll come on to that, uh, but much, much later. Okay, so here is the substantia nigra. Then we've got the substantia nigra pars reticulata here in blue. Okay, and we know that at present, the internal globus pallidus, which is here, and the substantia nigra pars reticulata over here, both of those are sending inhibitory neurons into the ventro anterior and the ventrolateral thalamic nuclei. Okay, so we'll colour these inhibitory GABAergic neurons in blue. Okay, and this 
at the moment is what is preventing uh, any sort of permissive signal from being allowed to go from the ventroanterior and the ventrolateral nuclei to uh, this area of secondary motor cortex um, that is actually um, involved in producing the motor plan uh, which we want to be allowed to go through. Okay, so here this is an excitatory pathway here. Okay, so at the moment this pathway is off, and it's off because the internal globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, they have neurons which are GABAergic, which are going on to all of the neurons of these two nuclei here and stopping them from firing. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to turn on the neurons of the ventroanterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei, which send excitatory input to this area of secondary motor cortex. Now note the specificity. We don't just want to turn on the entire of these two thalamic nuclei here, because that would allow all the motor plans that are being drawn up by the secondary motor cortex to be uh, relayed to the primary motor cortex. Okay, we just want to activate a specific portion of the ventroanterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei, which gives permission to this specific area of secondary motor cortex. Okay, so that's now what this cortical projection is going to do. The cortical projection from this particular area of secondary motor cortex is going to come down onto a particular area of the putamen. It's going to activate lots of these neurons in the putamen. Okay, and these neurons in the putamen are themselves going to be inhibitory neurons. Okay, so let's say we've got another one here, which will go on to the substantia nigra pars reticulata over here. And what's going to happen is you're now going to activate loads of these inhibitory neurons in the putamen, which are going to now inhibit certain portions of the globus pallidus internal segment and the substantia nigra pars reticulata. Okay, and those now are going to stop inhibiting a certain portion of the ventroanterior ventrolateral uh, thalamic nuclei. And that specific area will be the portion that activates that specific portion of secondary motor cortex. So, I will go through this again and highlight the specificity. So, this particular area of secondary motor cortex is going to send down activatory signals, not just one neuron, loads of things, okay, down into a certain area of the putamen, not the entire putamen. Okay, I should really be saying dorsal striatum because it could be portions of the chordate as well, although it is mainly the putamen. Okay, so you'll be sending these excitatory inputs into the dorsal striatum, into a certain portion of the dorsal striatum, not the entire dorsal striatum, okay, and then you'll be activating the inhibitory neurons in this area of the dorsal striatum, okay, and those will be projecting to certain areas then of the internal globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, and they will effectively tell these neurons, shut up. Okay, and now those neurons in those specific areas of these two nuclei here will now shut up and they will stop inhibiting s certain areas within the ventroanterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei and these special areas of these two nuclei that, have no, that now no longer have the inhibition coming to them will be the areas which innovate this area of secondary motor cortex. They'll send excitatory input up there and now that will give the permissive signal for the further development of this motor plan and then the relaying of this motor plan to the primary motor cortex. Okay, now note you do not uh, stop um, all areas of the internal globus pallidus and all areas of the substantia nigra pars reticulata. If you did that, then you would completely allow all of the neurons in the ventroanterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei to send activatory signals to all of the secondary motor cortex, and that would allow through all uh, the motor plans. So you only inhibit certain portions of these two nuclei here. The certain portions which correspond to the portions in these nuclei, which then correspond to this portion here of the secondary motor cortex. Okay, so that is the direct pathway. Now, at the same time, what you're going to do is you're going to activate the indirect pathway, which is the pathway that's going to uh, result in other um, 
areas of the secondary motor cortex not um, getting um, the permissive signal coming to them. Okay, so it's going to potentiate the inactivation of the other portions of the ventral anterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei to make absolutely sure that only the motor plan which we want to get through is actually going to go through. Okay, and we'll discuss the indirect pathway in the next video.